The following interview was conducted with Cyril B. Brown, Professor Emeritus of Agronomy for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, March 25, 2010 at his residence. Also sitting in is his wife, Princess. And good afternoon to both of you, and thank you. Let's yes, start uh, off if you tell me where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. I was born in Guyana in South America, in Georgetown, and my mother and father were Joseph and Letitia, and this was in 1920. That's about it. Okay. Do you have any siblings, brothers or sisters? I have had uh -huh. six of them. There are now only three of them left. Where did you fall? Are you the youngest or the oldest or in between? I'm the oldest of the brothers and the youngest of the sisters. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tell us about grade school and, high, and then go on to high school. Oh, grade school... Typical missionary school is, is in the colonies, and um, I did fairly well. Was it a medium-sized uh, school? Very was large? A, it had about three hundred, I would think. Uh -huh. It's a good size school. Ran from uh, to grade one to grade six, six standard we call it, six standard. And by the time I was in six standard, the time came for to move on to the next level, and one had to sit an examination. And only of the thousands of children in the country, there were only a few who would get what we called scholarships. I was lucky enough to get one of them. And moved on to a secondary school. Was that near where you lived? Near where I lived. We didn't have to leave the country yet, where, where I lived. And um, I went to secondary school, which was, a, which was called Queen's College. And Queen's Colleges and Queen's Royal Colleges at the time were all over in the colonies. In her town and country, it was Queen's Royal. In my place, it was Queen's College. I went to Queen's College. And I did exams for Oxford, Cambridge, London, got certificates, and ended up with what one used to call in those days an intermediate degree in science. That's the beginning of an elementary school. Mm -hmm. What was the school life like? What was it? Did you, were there any clubs that you joined? Or I played cricket. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I was in the debating society. I liked drama. Did some drama for me that day. Uh -huh. And it was else? a day school, so you went... Oh, it was a day in? school. Yeah, okay. It was a day school. Okay. We also did um, carpentry as part of our training. I was a cadet. I became a captain in the cadets. So that's the <laughs> good. Okay. Then what? Ca what came after? When you? What year did you graduate from there? Did you graduate? At okay, our I graduated grade? from there, and then my family, uh, some of them, moved to the next country, which is Trinidad. I went to Trinidad and worked in the civil service. Did you have to take an exam? No, I didn't have to take oh. an exam. The qualifications that I had would allow me to get a civil service job, an application, an interview, an application, and if I got a job in the civil service. The next thing up the line, I boast about this, I didn't pay any time for my education. The next part of the line where I, I got a United Nations Fellowship, which allowed me to choose between what was then called the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture, which at which graduate students came and studied tropical agriculture in Trinidad to get into the British Colonial Service. I, and... Uh, I decided I would rather go to Canada. So my scholarship was transferred from Trinidad to Canada. I went to McGill and received a bachelor's degree in chemistry and soils. What was college life like? You lived on, did you live on campus? Lived, by then I was married. Okay. We lived on campus. And my wife lived on campus. She was a college wife. <laughs> she lived on campus. She, so she, she accompanied me and since she, she was a part of the college life. She did things in those days, that, you know, like work in the. Did she work while you were in college? In, not at the, on the campus. Okay, good. Oh, and I might drop this in, and she's going to look at me at the campus. And she's a, an eminent musician. She's got a job as an accompanist for the choirs and for the dance clubs in the college. What do you call it here? Um, well, accompanist is usually pretty good. Do you play a, did she play an instrument? 
Oh, piano. Okay, the accompanist. That's what they use, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. she played. Oh, good. And incidentally, when we came to Purdue, she did the same thing for a while. Uh-huh. Now, after, now after, um, after you finished there, how did you like um, McGill? Oh, it's a good school. It's a nice school. It's very pleasant. It's a very old, old, old yeah, st- yes. prestigious institution. It is probably the right. best of the, of the British schools. It is the, one of the Oxford and Cambridge of, mm-hmm. or Harvard and Yale right. of Canada. One of the older ones, too, yes. a long time. It has a great reputation. Mm-hmm. So, McGill. Then what, when you finished, what did, what did you decide to do? And what was your major while you were in college? Well, my major was agriculture, soils, and chemistry. Okay. That was my major in those two fields. Okay. So that was it. And then I went back home and worked for seven years, published a number of books which were very good, and realized at that time that I had done as much as I could do in my country. Were you still with the civil or were you still with the British civil? I was now in the, I would now transfer to the British Civil Service. No longer the local civil service, the overseas British Civil Service. And I worked there for some while. And it was time for me to go on sabbatical leave, and I t- ended up going to my Purdue. How did you happen to select Purdue? I dis- the things I wanted to study, they were best taught, in my view, at that time, in this part of the world, in the Western world, at Purdue. And I came to Purdue and got an assistantship I was in a fellowship of some sort, National Science Foundation Fellowship, and I got um, an assistant with a man named Joe White, Dr. Joe White, who was in clay mineralogy. And in those days, that was the outside front, the front line of work in soils development. I got my uh, master's with him, and then... um, We, at the end of my master's, he ha- we were able on what we had done to apply for a United States National Science Foundation Fellowship. And he got the fellowship, and he needed me and the other guy who worked with him to come back and work. So I came back and worked with a PhD. Incidentally, I said United Nations Fellowship, mm-hmm. the first one... Um, the, f- the first one is United Nations Fellowship. Okay. This is an American United, American United States National Foundations Fellowship. So there okay. are two of them, I think. It's in there. Okay. Good. The first one was United Nations Fellowship, United Nations FAO Fellow, and the second was a U.S. National Science Fellow. So we send that bit of paper. So Where did you live when you came here? Where did you live? Married student housing or? I lived in my student housing for my grad, first graduate degree. Okay. And your but wife, of course, came My wife came you. back, and she came back and got the same job here mm-hmm. at, at Purdue. She worked under, I remember she worked under these deans, and they were particular dean. Her name I can't recall. Mm-hmm. In, in agriculture? No, in, she worked in, in physical education. Oh, okay. She was a lady dean, and she went, they kept in touch for many years. And then um who was the head of that department, I think. Mickey something or other, I think. I don't know. I think of the dean of... Or, or the dean, with, with, uh, Beverly Stone? No, it was before women? Beverly Stone. Oh, okay. I know Beverly Stone. Helen Schliemann. Might have been Helen Might Schliemann. Might have been. It wasn't Helen Schliemann. Okay. The dancing person, the, the, the person who taught dancing was... Uh, I can't remember. It's okay. Then uh, after you got your Ph.D., then what... Uh, after I got my Ph.D., I went back home and... Finally decided as a second time I had done all I could and I decided to look for a job elsewhere. Did and you think of staying at, did they offer you something at Purdue at the time you were at there? the time I came back they offered me when you got your PhD? Yeah. No the, well when I got my PhD I got an offer to work with Eli Lilly. They were willing to take me because the work I had done was a lot in their field of clay mineralogy and insecticides and, and, and pesticides and so on. But the condition of the job was I will take the job and um, without any permanency, give up all my years of service and see if they w- I will become permanent. And I, could, I didn't want to make that decision at that time. So I went back home and waited. And then sometime later on, I came back to Purdue and took a short job with them for a, lo- for a little while. It was, it was not 
permanent. I came back to Purdue and scouted the market and got a job in a southern school. Is that the... Um, Fort Valley State College. Yes, I want to ask about that. It was yeah. interesting because how it happened, uh, a professor from Purdue who was given the job of dean of... Is this is an interesting story. Dean in the School of Agriculture in the University of Georgia system thought he would have me leave Purdue and come and work with him in a black school while he worked in the white school. But he's, was he black or white? He was white. Oh, okay. He became director of agriculture for the federal government. Okay. I remember his name sometime. So he went down and he became dean in the University of Georgia system. And I got the job with him in a smaller school, which was a predominantly black school, Fort Valley State College. And we thought, between the two of us, we could make something happen between the two faculties. After eight years, he left. And he said, Cyril, would you like to join me and come to Texas here? Is that where Texas Tech comes in? Huh? I went to Texas. I okay. went to Texas Tech. I went to Texas. Where Bobby Knight is. <laughs> right now, I went to Texas Tech. What was it? Uh, tell us a little about that college. What was it like? You said it was a. What, it was, it it, had about, was it co ed? It was co ed. Okay. It had about 3,000. Uh, did student. it draw just from that region or within the state? It drew from the state, but mostly from that region. From that area, from that okay. Region, and was predominantly, almost totally, um, African American mm -hmm. in faculty and in staff and in administration. What was the size about? What were the enrollments? It was about 3,000. It was about 2,500, I think. If they lived in that region, did they, uh, was it a date? Would a lot of them just go home? No, they, 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 no, they, they, they stayed. They could stay on they campus. They could stay, okay. they could stay on campus. Okay. They could stay okay. on campus. Good. Uh, is it an older school? Had it been established for some time? It had been established for many years. Uh -huh. And it's still, now it's, it's, it's actually called Fort Valley State University. Many schools have changed That's their names like that. Yes, right. right. Okay. Well, tell us about Texas Tech. That was a change. That was a change, but <laughs> the, the, I, I spent very short time in the faculty. From the time I got to Texas Tech, they started using my in, knowledge in international soils. And I went off on the first project in Niger. One of the reasons I got that job is that I could, besides my ability in the field they wanted, agronomy, I spoke some French, mm -hmm. and I went off to Niger and worked there for four years. What was the nature of the work you were doing? Were you affiliated with an academic uh, institution? Um, Texas Tech. Okay. Oh, okay. The government. Um, USAID, okay. the foreign U.S. Agency for National Development, and we developed some systems of agriculture there, which we thought worked pretty well. So that was this year. And uh, by the time the Niger, oh, and this is something you should know. From the time I went to Texas Tech and I started making my little bits of things available, Purdue kept inviting me to come back and join the faculty. I think somebody thought I was had some sense or something. And I, more than that, I thought, I think, this is in the 1960s, late and 60s. You were Texas Tech, 76 to right. 1980. So, so this was in the 60s and 70s. Oh. And uh, uh, this should be on record, I think. Not only were they looking for minorities to go into schools with majorities, but and not only if not they weren't only looking, they were not only looking for the brilliancy or, or abilities of scientists, they were looking for compatible minorities. I got offers in Oxford, um, Harvard, Yale, Purdue, to come work with them. And I knew it was not only, I had been around the, the administration in Washington, I'd been around different places, and I think it was more my ability to work with majorities. Worked we, well with we, them. So Purdue kept inviting me, you come back, I'll give you a job. As an, I left as an assistant professor, assistant professor, assistant professor. Every time a vacancy came up, I went to Fort Valley. I became full professor department head. 
I went to Texas Tech, professor, a director of international programs. They still kept asking me, coming back as assistant professor. And then suddenly it dawned upon somebody. We offer my job as a full professor. So I came back in 1980 right, yeah. uh -huh. as a professor. Right. Marvin Phillips, who was indeed one of my associates, had now become the head of the department. And so I came back. Mm -hmm. So here I was at Purdue once again. When um, you talk, talk a little about your teaching. You've gotten quite a few awards, and you taught yeah. some of the agronomy courses. Working, you worked with both undergraduates and graduate students? And I taught graduate programs. Okay. In, okay. At, down in this... At this, these schools, they were undergraduate anyway. Those sure. were schools. But at Purdue, oh, each one was a 500 plus course. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see that. Right. So okay. You all and then uh, tell, you talk a little bit about the research. Do you continue on with that while you were here when you came back to Purdue? Uh, no. Not as much. Okay. No. I had done most of my research by the time I'd finished my PhD. I'd made my mark in my research field by then. I did do some some research in Africa, but it was a, it's a, a lower level. It was more like a feed level for helping farmers. Mm -hmm. the research had been published in... And I was going to follow works that you got. Yeah, yes. That's very nice, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, IPA, you were the, the first African-American to be a project coordinator at IPIA. I'm sure about that. Right. This was, I think, I picked up That's from you. The first and I think this is a very nice quote. In transferring knowledge from a developed country to an underdeveloped country, that success did not depend entirely on agronomic expertise, but on the understanding and appreciation mm -hmm. of existing farming practices, mm -hmm. the culture, and also the religion of the host country. That's right. Nicely said. Yes, that's right. Right. I felt that way, and I, 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 I give an example of that on, on Fort Taping. You drive through the country, in foreign countries, especially in Africa, and uh, people don't have tombs. Only in the Catholic regions you'll have a tomb or something like that. You're driving through a tomb. And one day I was driving through way out somewhere in the forest. God knows where. 20, 100 miles from any place. And we came across a, a burial ground. And in this burial ground, which had nothing, no tombs, there was one tomb or two or three tombs which took out that had flowers in them. And uh, I, I, brought it, I brought this picture back and showed it to some of my my friends, and in talking about it, one day I gave a letter. I said, "You see, it's strange. In Africa, when oh, they had they had um, cooking pots and so on the tombs in Africa. Cooking pots. They have pots, pots and pans and cups and glasses on the tombs. So uh, somebody said to me, um, why they put pots and pans and things? I said, you know, it's strange, but you have to understand the culture of the people." Why do we put flowers on our graves? The Africans believe, and this particular tribe, that when they go from here to there and they arrive, they need the cooking utensils, which made more sense to me right. <laughs> than putting a bunch of flowers. And that comes up very often I talk about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Are they? Um, do they have... Uh, a gravestone in these? No, no. Only, only it happens, I think in the big cities you will okay. find gravestones. because okay, But not in the country. Not probably. in the countryside. Only gravestone you will find in the countryside is where a Catholic priest has had, died. Has died. He's buried. That's interesting. And so they will have a gravestone for him. Mm. Do they maintain these cemeteries? Do they take care of them? As far as I know, yes. Okay, so the community, pro their community, they're, yes, you're yes, buried right near them. Okay, okay. interesting. But the flowers really caught your eye. Yeah, the flowers. I uh, said, I said, I said, I have pots and pans, you know, you know, they, they have their pots and pans. I said, well, Tell us a little bit more about your affiliation with IPIA. And, of course, Woods Thomas. You, Woods you, Thomas is the man at the time. Uh, I met him a few times. Of course, he's deceased. Yeah, he's deceased. His wife he, is deceased. Did he die while he was at Purdue, or did he did he leave Purdue? I think I he read? died while he was at Purdue. Purdue, okay. He right. might have He'd died. been in that job for quite a while. Yes, his wife died, and then he died, or vice versa. Both of them died. Mm -hmm. He smoked profusely. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. What were some of the, uh, what was your involvement? What were some of the things that you were involved with with the IPIA? Okay, well, the Nasia project was one of them. Okay. I brought the, the second part of it here with me. 
uh, we brought students, one of the things we did well, was to bring students from over in Africa, put them through the our agricultural program and send them back to take positions of leadership in Africa, just like the programs in South America. Uh, uh, Mike, back again, this is historical. You go to s school in, Af in, in well, it's Africa, two African countries, in the Niger and Zaire, spend some time in Tunisia. You, um, when you go, when you end, and I, this is, and I also have to make it clear, this is French Africa. When you end your high school, that is the end of your academic career. That's it. So if you didn't pass a certain exam at the end of your high school program, that was it. You have to go to work. Right. If you made certain exams, you could go on to Paris or someplace to get a further degree. But other students with very high capabilities had nowhere to go. And what was happening in the world that they looked at these kids because they didn't pass this exam to go to, to Europe, drop them. And these are the kids I picked on. And said so the only reason these kids didn't get any further is because they didn't have any help to go any further. Let us pick out the best that we find out with this bunch. And those are the ones that the United Nations and Purdue accommodated here for years. And they went back and became leaders not only in their countries, but to some of the other African countries. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Did, were they prim did you get both male and female? Were they, uh, uh, I don't or most think, of them were no, male. we had no females. Mm. All were males. Mm -hmm. and, but many of them came, or some of them came and brought their wives with them. Mm -hmm. But this in the literature, when they would come here with their wives, well-educated, but not in our culture. And they would come, and princess would have them come over. You know, they would, they would, when they go back now, they're going to have jobs in a higher level. These are farm children. They would come to our house, and she would put them through their you know, treats and caring, how you did this when you went back. In spite of their ability to have learned well in school, they probably didn't know how to set a table. So this is the group of people that she worked sure. yeah. mm. Well, that was about as far as we got then. Anything else? Um, the uh, Some of the things about AID, well, the Tunisia project was sort of interesting. Yeah, the, the Tunisia project, they, they, that was, oh, I picked up the $26, 26 million. Dollars. We didn't get that project. It was the mid... Uh, uh, that is a stage where what I was living on was my ability to deal with a foreign country and with the knowledge, as I said, for understanding how you thought. And so when they were writing this project for Mid-America... Yeah, the Mid-America uh, International Agricultural Consortium. Consortium. Right. Uh, I was invited to go and lead the, the, the cooperation and the management. And we wrote this project. We didn't get the project at Purdue, but the project was funded. And apparently some, we, I don't know what we got out of it. I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure in some will grow out of that. Some other, um, <clears throat> um, I think we had some people go out from Purdue on this project, but we did not have the sole management of the project, but I did half write it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was the, the, the Tunis, that was a twenty-six million dollar yeah, project. That's, that's big. Right. And they were, I realize this on consortium. There's no way one universe was going to get it anyway. Uh, if you look up, you will see what made the made American International Consortium was. Mm -hmm. uh, a few other schools were in that group. Yeah. On IPIA, just for the researchers, yeah. you worked. Uh, just tell a little bit that you tried to get, get grants, isn't that pretty much? Oh yes, my, my, just for the researchers you, so they yeah, understand. My, in IPIA with Lowell Harden, right? Um, he was working there. I, this was my job. My job was to try to get grants so we could have projects overseas sure. 
with money from t for international programs from AID. Now that is where we got most of our money. Okay. Was it pretty good in those days? Oh, it was pretty good in those days. I mean, you could raise a $10 million project. And incidentally, I, wonder, you, you just, I saw in the paper the other day somebody about a million dollar group or a million dollar club. Did you see that in the papers? Purdue has a million dollar club. No, I didn't see that. Uh, I should be in that group. I want to find out about it. I have it there. Did, mm. yeah. did you have? Did some of the projects involve visitation? Did you go over there and work work with some of the people on some of these projects? I spent. We lived in the oh, countries. Yeah. Okay. We, okay. I lived in in Niger for four years. Mm -hmm. I went back afterwards in other years. We, I visited Niger. I didn't live in Niger. I lived in uh, Zaire. I, I visited Niger to inspect the project. Right. Okay. And, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, you were the Associate Dean of the Graduate School. That's right. Tell us a little bit about your duties okay. there. How it, how it works is that the, um, for some reason, the, somewhere up the ladder, ladder they discuss <laughs> people they would like to have as deans. <laughs> and so I was invited to become an Associate Dean in the Graduate School. Shraddha Arna came in to me and asked if I would accept the job as an Assistant Dean in the Graduate School. And I had accepted a job as a sitting dean in the graduate school. Now, strange about this. If you know the name, oh my gosh, he was there for many years. He's living now up at um, University Place. What's the name of the man who lives at University Place, the professor that we know so well? He, 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 he used to be. I mean, anyhow, he was, he's at University what, what, the, the, the dean of the graduate school has always been vice president for research. Oh, yes. <coughs> the now they've changed it. It has changed. Yes. The dean of the graduate school gave responsibilities to his associate deans. They ran the graduate school. So all the graduate students on campus came under the associate. auspices of the associate. And that job I had for at least four years. Mm -hmm. At the same time, writing projects in one place and teaching program in the other place. It was a hard time. Full, full plate. Full time. That's right. To a point where if I, I, I'd leave one office to go to the other, well, I, I had never, I always had a boss. And I left, I, it was what I, did, I had to, t I used to tell my secretaries where they'll find me for fear that they would think I went. <laughs> uh, another thing I was going to ask you, you did some consulting. You've done yes, um, yes. Uh, for the re uh, Texas oil and Shell oil. Right. Are you still, do you still? No, no more consulting. Did you do some after you retired? No, none whatsoever. All this okay. was done when I was still working. Okay. What was the nature of the things that you did when you were doing consulting? Okay. The, the Texas oil one was it Texas and some other companies decided they wanted to make a great subscription to agriculture in, in Trinidad. And they wanted to do studies on the land capabilities or land use of the countries. And they gave the government a large sum of money, plenty of money in those days, I don't know what it was. And I was given the project to write it and see what we did. And I, I might find a copy of one of the books and what we did and let you have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. So we were able to see it in this country, these are the lands, these are the soils, these are the pr products, this is how you farm them, these are the results. And that became a blueprint for the way they did development in developing countries. And I think it was listed, in, I know it was listed in um, Encyclopedia Britannica and described as one of the best at the time. That's very good. Yeah. And you also did the, what about that consortium for international development? Uh, I thought I had read that, a consortium for international development. Was that you did some consulting with them or not? Maybe I had the wrong one. Yeah. Research Analysis Corporation? What, uh, these are all in, 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 mm, in Washington. They have these okay, companies right, who okay. require you to come in and give your opinions on subjects. Sure, okay. So they will ask you for your opinion. As a matter of fact, this one, I think, consortium, 
I would stay in my office and they'd send me um, work to, by done by other people. But in the beginning, they would invite you to come down and pay your, your fare, put you up in a hotel for a couple of days and chat with you and give you some lunch and then give you these big papers and ask you opinions. It reached the stage where they would send me the information. I didn't even have to go to visit. And I would send their opinions back. And I would get paid a certain salary per day for doing Very that. Very nice. Very That's nice. Well, another one was that American Technical Assistance Corporation. A similar situation. Similar yeah, these were technical. big yeah. people in Washington, big yeah. offices, and they wanted, they wanted opinions yeah. on subjects. Uh, one of them, for example, was... Somewhere in South America, we're building a road in South America from one side to, no, in, in the isthmus. Building a road from one side in the isthmus, the other side in the isthmus. And they wanted my opinion about it. And they, they had known, for example, that somewhere in the past, I had actually walked up a road in Trinidad and reported, well, look, you better do something about it, it's going to fall apart soon. And it had come down a few days later. So the, the structure of the land that they were using, and the isthmus was similar, and they wanted my opinion about it. Okay. Uh, I think we forgot. Uh, South America, what, what sort of involvement did you have in South America? Nothing. Nothing? No, nothing. You didn't do any work down there? No, no. Uh, IPI, just, you didn't have any no, no. Uh, we didn't projects have any, down there? No, no. Okay. The works, the land capability of Trinidad and Tobacco, great. That's it. Wonderful. I, I, I could find it. Yeah. I'll get a yeah. copy for you sometime. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, family, talk a little bit about where did you meet your wife? And your I met my wife in Trinidad. I met her in church. We got married. We have one daughter. Okay. We is have two grandchildren. Does your daughter live here in town? No, she lives in Maryland. Okay. And how uh, old are the grandchildren? One has just turned 21. That's the girl. She's in university in Georgia. And the boy has turned 24. And he's going to graduate with a master's degree. And he wants to go into to become a and accounted CPA. Oh, okay. Keep, take care of the finances. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, any awards or honors that you'd like to share with us? Did you receive some over your time? Any particular award that uh, you recall? Or any honors? I can't think of any. I what sort of thing did them. they have for your retirement? We had a big banquet. Uh huh. And uh, the professors came out and made statements of my ability. And one of them, if it's Dr. White's report, was pretty nice. I I got a watch for little things like, you know, getting students to go to graduate school, my attitudes. I was a member of the American Society of Agronomy for a while. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I was going to ask you about some of your professional associations. I took a minority students to the, to the programs, and uh, I was so honest. My students would get up to the area where they'd be like in for the finals. And I would say, well, now this, you have to go and produce this on your own. I wouldn't work it. And I didn't realize that others would still be tutoring. <laughs> and so they would end up being getting the second degree or something. Mm. Do you still keep in touch? Do some of the grad students still keep in touch with you? Some of them do. Oh, that's nice. All right. And um, the grad the grad students from here still keep in touch with me. And uh, this is an interesting story. One suddenly one day one called and he said he comes to see me. He comes to see me, and he came to see us really. And he said. Um, when he's about to leave, he said, well, he had to go in a hurry. Some, said, I came to see my parents. I was touching. Was Very it? nice. Yeah. Uh, you, you were in Murmuric Chemical Society and yes. uh, Indian Academy of Science. Right, and Rot right. Rotary, you still go to the Rotary? No. Oh, they have a chapter here. I know. Yeah, I give right. you a reason why I don't go, but I don't. That's okay. And the Agricultural Society of Trinidad and Tobacco. That's and right. Tobago. Right. Okay. Retirement activities. What do you? What sort well, of good stuff are you in? It's interesting. I am. Um, would you believe I'm an ordained minister in the Methodist Church? Very nice. Yeah. 
I was ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and also worked very hard in the United Methodist Church. So, after I retired, I... Did you take early retirement? Or no, no. no. Okay. Early retirement. You could have taken... Did you decide to go on halftime? Did you have Nothing that at all. I worked, you chose not to. Uh, no. Um, so I keep involved in my church work. What sort of activities? Well, I still... I, no, I don't still do it. I taught senior high school students in... Here in town? Here in town. Okay. Uh, I am on the member of the church board <coughs> on its foundation. We handle all the money they have for distribution, and this runs into millions of dollars. I still work on the missions committee. Help out. What is the mission committee? What are they mission are they doing at the moment? They have just helped in uh, a few years ago helped in the building of a university in Zimbabwe, a Methodist Church in Zimbabwe. We just raised some thousands of dollars to go to Haiti. And all the other things in town we support, like, you know, food for kids and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Is the university, it was established already, and then you helped to build, or did you, was the money to go towards building it, the Zimbabwe? Uh, we had money going towards building the university. And <coughs> excuse me, my church made a contribution of $10,000, and I made a personal contribution of another $10,000 to build a dormitory room with our names on it. Very and good. it is the, I think, is the only totally all African university in Africa. That, uh, we're having a rough time. Very nice. But I could say this. In spite of all the problems going on in Zimbabwe, they have not touched or interfered with operation of the campus. And we have not interfered with them either. So they let us go. Have you, have you visited there? I never did. I wish I would. And now I don't think I'll travel yeah. anymore. They, they should send you. You've got pictures, so they should send pictures or have they? Well, do? I get them all the time. Sure, that's and nice. Yeah. Any special? Any other hobbies or special interests that you have? Besides my my um, my church work, I don't think I have any hobby now. But I used to do my gardening and things like that. <laughs> now somebody does it for you. I've well, you can have food. a garden. They have gardens. They have gardens here, yeah. but I don't. I, yeah, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, is there uh, in closing? Did is there something that I neglected to ask or I'll let you make some summary, make some general comments as you look forward and over your long career? You decide to remain in West Lafayette? I decided to remain in West Lafayette. Uh -huh. um, my family is just banded all over the world. We hear from them regularly. Uh -huh. But um, and it's, it's, all the families say that. Be, uh, we're part of each other. So, um, I think you always look for the best in people. And people have described me as saying, you can tell somebody the most hurtful thing, but in such a way they will understand that what you're telling them is good, or what's that effect, and that is about... I, That's I think an art. That, mm -hmm. I think about that all the time. Uh, you, and they will say, mm, that is good. It happens here, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Dr. Professor Murphy, that's it. Nothing very else. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Is, I appreciate that. Got everything? Yeah, I think okay. you got most okay, of it. Okay, good. Yeah.